much. And uh, now we will uh, move on um, to uh, David Moss. Uh, he is the, well, he's, he's listed here, uh, I've seen in, in, with two different sorts of professorships, so I won't name, name either one at the moment, but he is a professor at the Harvard Business School where he teaches in the Business, Government, and International Economy Unit. His research focuses primarily on economic policy and the government's role as a risk manager. Professor Moss is the founder of the Tobin Project, a nonprofit research organization and a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. In recent years, he's devoted increasing attention to questions of democratic governance and its evolution over time. Professor Moss's latest book, Democracy, a Case Study, explores key episodes in the history of American democracy from the Constitutional Convention to Citizens United. His talk is on revitalizing civic education, one discussion at a time. Well, thank you. Um, look, it's really such an honor uh, to be here uh, this afternoon. I wanna just start by expressing my appreciation really to two people, Howard Gardner and Annie Westcott for uh, introducing me to the society and for encouraging me to talk about some of the work that I've been doing on the history of American democracy. So there are really two, uh, two aspects of this work. There's the research side, where I've been trying to understand what, what really distinguishes a healthy democracy from an unhealthy one. Can we, can we make that distinction? And then there's the teaching side where I've developed a new uh, case-based curriculum on the history of American democracy. I think it's the first of its kind. I introduced it initially at Harvard. Uh, it's now spread to a number of other universities, but more strikingly, it's spread to high schools, uh, hundreds of high schools and uh, across the country. So uh, I've been excited about that. I don't have uh, much time, it's a short, a presentation, but I thought I would try to talk at least briefly about both threads, the research side and the teaching side. And I also want to be uh, sure to share as much as I can about the results we've been seeing in high school classrooms as part of this initial pilot. We, we launched it um, a few years ago. It's, it's involved about 30,000 students in 45 states. That's just to do the initial testing. And I, I wanted to give you a sense of what we've, what we've found. So I'll get to the high school project and the, and the progress we've been seeing in high school history, government and civics classes in, in just a few minutes. But first I thought I would start with kind of a quick overview of the research side of the effort. So um, as you may know, as, as you heard from that very kind introduction, I'm an American economic and, and policy uh, historian. And for many years, my kind of principal focus was on the government's role in managing risk um, and, and how this role has changed over time. So I, everything from limited liability law to to social security. Um, but starting around 2010, I became really increasingly interested in the history of democratic governance, and particularly, as, as I just mentioned, in this question of what distinguishes a healthy democracy from an unhealthy one. Can, can we make that distinction? And it turns out it's quite a difficult question because I would say it's made all the more difficult, I should say, because critics, observers, um, really uh, in the United States from the earliest days of, of the Republic in, in every single generation uh, have claimed that the nation's democracy uh, is on the verge of collapse. So you hear that, you know, today, uh, it, it's always been true. And so the question is, how can we distinguish our, you know, this sort of uh, hypo political hypochondria, maybe if you could call it that, when, when is it right and when, when is it wrong? So in any case, I've struggled with this question for, for many years. And I, I can't say that I have a, a perfect or complete answer, but I do think I have the beginnings of an answer and I wanna share that with you. So there are really two pieces of the answer that I wanna uh, provide. The first piece has to do with political conflict. And it might be a little different from what you're expecting because one of the things I've noticed again and again across American history is that some of the greatest moments of progress, and I, I focus mainly on economic history, so, um, so I would say particularly economic progress, um, ha have been associated with actually very high levels of partisan conflict. So high conflict, not, not low. And, and, and in a sense, that's just the opposite of what many pundits are telling us today, that too much partisan conflict is kind of ripping the country apart. I actually don't think that's quite the right analysis. And, and so if you look back historically, I only have time to give you, you one example, but I, I do want to give you this, this one example. If you start with antebellum New York State, it's an interesting place to look. So New York at that time in the early 19th century was a place of intense partisanship and political division um, between Democrats and Whigs, but also, and maybe uh, often even more intensely, 
between different factions of the Democratic Party. And if you go back to the newspapers of the day, you will see how intense, sometimes even how vicious this political conflict was. And yet, New York performed brilliantly, at least in economic terms and policy terms. It proved enormously innovative uh, over the first half of the 19th century. New York State, for example, invented general incorporation with limited liability, the first jurisdiction to do that. It invented modern bank regulation, including bank insurance back in 1829, the first jurisdiction in the world, uh, I believe, to do that. It, it had arguably the most advanced infrastructure policy in the country, the Erie Canal and so forth. It followed Massachusetts. It wasn't first, but it followed Massachusetts in moving toward free public education and building human capital. And overall, by, you know, by the 1850s, New York State was almost certainly the leading economic jurisdiction uh, in, the, in the United States. And, and, and many have argued that it was the leading economic jurisdiction by the 1850s in the world. Now, as I read the historical record, intense political conflict in New York State, it wasn't an obstacle to innovation and growth. It was in fact a source of strength. It was a catalyst for new ideas. So just in the same way, when you think about innovation in the economic marketplace, it's driven by competition, by conflict. So you see that in the economic marketplace, in the political marketplace, I think we see much the same thing, that new ideas, innovation is driven by conflict, tension, uh, uh, including partisan conflict in the political marketplace. So that's one thing that I learned. But then there's another very important piece. What I also learned from studying this period in antebellum New York and many other periods, but let me just stick on New York for a minute. New York enjoyed in this early 19th century an extraordinarily strong culture of democracy, if I, if I can call it that. And, and that culture, that strong, strong culture of democracy really cut across the political spectrum. New Yorkers during this antebellum period shared really a deep commitment to democratic process. You can see it in many, many different guises, a deep faith in kind of self-governance and the, the democracy itself. And, and just as an example, this was visible in just about every major policy debate of the time. So if you just look at any debate that we can uh, look at from the early 19th century in New York State, what you'll see is lots of partisan conflict, but also this kind of shared commitment to democracy that is uh, just evident, extremely evident in, in the discussions. So I wish I had more time to describe this, but I can hardly overstate how important it is. This culture of democracy, this commitment to democratic process, institutions, values, this is the glue, I think, that held everything and everyone together. So at, at root, it's, it's this strong culture of democracy, I'm suggesting, that ensured that even high levels of political conflict prove productive rather than destructive. And, and again, you can see this dynamic, not just in antebellum New York, you can see it in case after case across American history. A healthy democracy, I think, requires both plenty of political conflict to generate ideas, that's on the one hand, and a strong culture of democracy, a shared commitment to democratic process, institutions, and values on the other. And based on the history as I read it, this, it's this combination that's absolutely essential, vital to ensuring productive conflict and a healthy democracy. And its absence, by the way, especially if you see a weakened culture of democracy, which I'm gonna come back to because that's quite relevant to today. In its absence, I think you can see that conflict, that political conflict can suddenly flip from being constructive to being destructive. So I could give you many other examples beyond New York State. I don't have time. So in the interest of time, what I want to do is shift gears and now talk about this case-based curriculum that I created on the history of American democracy, the impact that it seems to be having, and then bring it back, tie it back to this culture of democracy question that I was just, uh, just addressing. So I'll say from the beginning of this work that I started out on the history of American democracy, uh, which again was late 2010 is when I started uh, turning my attention to that, I, I decided that creating a case-based course should be a core part of, of this new work uh, uh, on the history of American democracy. And part of the reason for that is several years before that, starting around 2006, I had created a case-based course on financial history for the MBA program at Harvard Business School. And I learned a tremendous amount. I learned not only from developing the 20 plus cases, that was an immense learning experience. Um, covering kind of global uh, key moments in, in global financial history, including a lot of financial crises. Um, but I also discovered how powerful and how effective it was to teach history by the case method. 
Um, I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, but I'll just say starting in, you know, when I, I, I started creating that course in 2006, I launched it in 2008, as it happens, just as the fin financial crisis was hitting. And I just never seen anything like this in the classroom. Uh, and at first I thought maybe it's because of the financial crisis. I still teach that course now. I still have the same kind of energy uh, in the classroom. I, again, I've just not seen anything like it in, in teaching history. And so I've been quite devoted to this. And so when I started to think about creating a new course on the history of American democracy, uh, I, I have to say I was determined to try to use the case method. But that meant writing a lot of cases, uh, which is a big effort. So I had the opportunity to work with some just stellar, stellar co-authors. It took about two years to develop the initial set of cases. We, of course, have been working ever since, expanding them and, and, and refining them. But I finally started teaching the course itself, both to undergraduates and MBA students uh, in, the fall of, in the fall of 2013. And it turned out, I will tell you, to be incredibly exciting. The first year was the smallest. There were only about 40 students, um, equally divided between undergraduates and MBA students. But by the next year, the course was massively oversubscribed. I, I only had 100 seats that I could offer, um, and we had a, you know, a, a demand many, many times over. I used a business school classroom, uh, which is sort of designed for the case method. It seated 100. I allowed in 80 undergraduates and 20 MBA students. I think it may have been the first time that we did that kind of mixing. I'm, I'm not sure. But what I can tell you is that the students, both undergraduates and MBA students, were just extraordinarily engaged. Uh, like in a typical business school class, every class session revolved around a case study that focused on a key episode, except instead of it being on a key episode in business management, it was a key episode in the history of American democracy. And each case ended, as in the business cases, with a major decision facing a historical figure or group, but again, without revealing the outcome. So in a sense, we put the, the students into the shoes of decision makers without revealing what decision was actually made. Each case also provided a tremendous amount of historical context. In fact, the vast majority of every case is context, background. And then the last page or two is about this uh, final decision. Anyway, I hope that the context itself was of value. But again, it also provides students with kind of the necessary historical foundation to think through the decision in question. When we arrived you know, in class, my job uh, was to ask questions and challenging questions, to push students on their thinking, to encourage them to debate uh, and, and, and deliberate and to help them clarify their own views. So I'd push you know, pretty hard on the students and hopefully not too, too hard, but um, uh, try to get them to try to figure, figure things out and, and also to help them learn from people with different perspectives. One other striking thing is when you, when you do history this way, when you, when you try to study history this way, um, you really see the contingency of history. Often if we just look backwards, of course, history it looks like it, it, it occurred the only way it could occur. But when you actually get into the shoes of, 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 of actual people at the time, of people who are making decisions, like all of us make decisions, you see how uncertain it is going forward when you're looking going forward. And, and so the contingency of history really becomes clear. I must say, initially, I wasn't sure what to expect from the undergrads because I was told that they probably wouldn't do the reading, that they wouldn't participate. Um, they'd never used the case method before. I have to say, I was just astounded because none of that was true. They, they, they were extraordinary. And I was just struck by how well they prepared the cases, uh, how actively they participated in class. At any given moment, there were literally dozens of hands. It was almost too many hands uh, to keep track of. And this was happening day after day, case after case. And I could see the students literally in front of my eyes. I could see them building their critical thinking skills. As I was pushing back on them, other students were pushing back and they were having to defend, refine, self-criticize uh, uh, their, their, own, their own thinking. So when it, time, when it came time for, for course evaluations, students reported not only that the case method was a more engaging and more effective way of studying history than they'd experienced before. That was nearly universal across the students. But they also reported, really to my great surprise, that working through the cases strengthened their level of civic interest, their level of civic knowledge, the civic engagement and that civic engagement piece I, I, caught me by surprise. They said that they were more involved in civic organizations, in political campaigns and so on. So this was, and they, and they, and they attributed it to being excited about being involved in these case discussions. So that was really astonishing to me and encouraging. And in addition, I should add that a number of the undergraduates, so this is back in 2014, 2015, a number of the undergraduates ended up recommending the cases 
and the case method to their former high school teachers. And so that's how we started, that's how we started getting into high schools. And in fact, this whole uh, effort began with two high school teachers, one in Pennsylvania and one in Indiana, who had heard about the cases and the case method from their former students who, who, who went on to Harvard. And, and they asked, like, they, you know, they wrote to me and they asked if they could give this a try. So I sent them the cases along with uh, my teaching plans. And it turns out that they both had um, great, great experience, experiences. One was a history teacher, one was taught a government class. That, and that was the spring of 2015. And in the fall of that year, we decided to launch kind of a small pilot project. We recruited about 20 teachers, uh, mostly from the Northeast, but some from other parts of the country. Um, and we brought them to Harvard Business School for a special workshop on our case-based curriculum. And that initial experiment proved so successful, in fact, wildly successful, that we decided, decided to expand it over the next several years, ultimately reaching uh, several hundred teachers as part of that initial pilot and approximately 30,000 students uh, from across the country. And what, what we did and what we continue to do is introduce teachers to the case method and our democracy cases first at a training workshop several days, originally held in person on the Harvard Business School campus and now held online for obvious reasons. And we provide ongoing coaching and support uh, individualized after that. We also make everything available, the professional development workshop, the ongoing coaching, the cases, the teaching plans, all the materials entirely free of charge to the teachers. And, and that is something we've wanted to do, but it's also, I think, quite important because it helps ensure teacher independence. Teachers don't have to ask administrators uh, whether they can do this, whether they can get the funding. They make the decision whether they want to do it, whether they want to drop it. Um, it's, it's really completely uh, up to them. And that sovereignty, I think, has led to better results. We've also seen remarkably high adoption and retention rates. So we've been We've been happy about that. As I mentioned at the outset, we've been, we've been thrilled with the results, so much that we're now working to scale the effort, aiming to reach thousands of teachers rather than hundreds and hundreds of thousands or more students uh, rather than just thousands over the next a few years. And already as part of the pilot, I should tell you, we've been working now with every type of school from every uh, uh, part of the country, urban, rural, suburban schools, public district schools, charter schools, private schools, Title I, non-Title I, the full spectrum from the most challenged school you can imagine to the most privileged and everything in between. And in fact, our sample now very, very closely reflects the nation as a whole, whether you're thinking about uh, demographics or, uh, or geography or type of school. And across the board, across the board, we have seen truly remarkable results. I don't have time to go into all the details uh, here, but let me just give you a, a, quick, a quick sense of this. Teachers, we, we've, we've uh, surveyed and interviewed teachers uh, who've, who've done this and they overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly report that use of the cases and the case method strengthened their, their students' critical thinking skills. That's probably first and foremost and strengthened their ability to make evidence-based arguments. Also strengthened their ability to vocalize their opinions, to draw connections across readings. Use of the cases also improved students' motivation, their level of effort, and their interest in the material. At the same time, teachers report again by just overwhelming margins that using the cases dramatically, dramatically increase their own job satisfaction, their sense of professional growth, their excitement about teaching and their confidence in the classroom. We also interviewed and surveyed students and students meanwhile report that use of the cases and the case methods strengthen their experience in the class across numerous dimensions, their level of confidence, their ability to think historically, their ability to make an argument with evidence, their ability to look at issues from another person's point of view. They also report that using the cases strengthen the overall value of the course in which those cases were being used. And in nearly every instance, th these impacts that I'm talking about, these effects increased with dosage. So classes that use more cases uh, saw larger impacts. In addition, as compared to students in comparable courses, who didn't use cases. So we had a comparison group and uh, a, a sort of identical a courses, but didn't use the cases. Those who did use cases reported greater interest in history, greater understanding of major political issues faced in the US, greater confidence in their ability to make an argument using evidence and so on. They also reported greater interest in civic involvement in the future, such as running for office and significantly uh, a larger number of students who used cases as compared to the comparison group who didn't reported a score of 10 out of 10 on the 
on the question from the World Value Survey of how important is it to live in a country that's governed democratically. That number has been quite low among uh, those in the younger generation. Once people started using some of these cases there, their numbers went up, uh, at, at the comparison group uh, really didn't. As for test scores, we don't yet have uh, much data on how use of the cases affects student performance uh, on, on standardized tests. That said, a number of teachers have run what are essentially controlled experiments in their schools. That is, they had multiple sections of the same course, for example, and would use cases in some of the sections, but not others, or in some classrooms and not others. And, uh, and, and what they found is that students who use the cases performed significantly stronger on tests, in fact, dramatically stronger on essays, and often, but not in every case, stronger on multiple choice and short answer questions as well. I, I could go on and on about this, as you can probably tell. But the bottom line is that this new case-based approach to teaching American history in high schools it seems, seems to be working. And it seems to be working quite well from both an educational and a democracy standpoint. And I'll say it's not just in classrooms. We've also organized sessions, these case discussions for many other groups. For example, we've organized case discussions for lawmakers, legislative leaders, including majority and minority leaders of state legislatures, senior staff in Congress at the Library of Congress, and increasingly, we've been organizing open case discussions for the general public in communities across the country. We just did uh, two more, one on Sunday and one on Tuesday, open to the public, hundreds of people involved. And this latter effort for the general public is in partnership with local chapters of the League of Women Voters. Remarkably, in all of these sessions, from high school classrooms to public venues to the Library of Congress, what we're seeing is vibrant and engaged discussions. I've personally led hundreds of these discussions and not once, I mean, it's a kind of amazing, not once have I seen partisan rancor enter into the discussion in any of the discussions, even among the most partisan audiences you can imagine. The focus incredibly remains on history. There's disagreement, of course, plenty of disagreement, but the focus remains on history. Um, and I've just been so pleased by that. And when the League of Women Voters has surveyed uh, 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 members of the general public who attend the, those sessions, much like in high school classrooms, those who participate in these case discussions become report becoming more interested in democracy, more interested in voting, even to some extent more interested in running for office themselves, and perhaps most striking of all, more interested in engaging with people they disagree with. And so in a sense, these findings, um, uh, bring us back to the question I raised at the outset about what distinguishes a healthy democracy from an unhealthy one. As you'll recall, what, what I suggested is that a healthy democracy requires both vigorous political conflict in the form of partisan competition, for example, as well as a strong culture of democracy. That is a robust and widely shared commitment to democratic process institutions and values. Today, there's no question, I think, no question, that we have plenty of partisan conflict. We're, there's no shortage of that. However, there's a great deal of evidence that our culture of democracy has weakened, that it's atrophied. And this is not just over the past few years, but over several decades. Uh, you can see it very clearly, unfortunately, in survey data um, that this culture of democracy has weakened. And that there's also the suggestion that the problem is particularly acute among younger Americans. So my own read is that this is really a very serious problem because a weaker culture of democracy threatens to make political conflict less constructive and potentially even destructive. Maybe we're already starting to see some of that. that that's the bad news. The good news though, is that the historical record also suggests, strongly suggests, that it's possible to strengthen our culture of democracy in all sorts of ways. I, I don't have time to go into the full, uh, uh, um, menu. But uh, one way, and not the only way to be sure, but an important way, is through our educational system. And that's why revitalizing civic education and doing it in a way that's really meaningful and engaging for students is so important. In our schools, I would say first and foremost, but also in our community, communities more broadly, we have to embrace civic education and civic discussion to help safeguard and strengthen our culture of democracy. And that's why this case-based approach to history and civics, which I originally developed for Harvard undergraduates and MBA students, has taken on really a whole new significance for me personally. I never expected to be devoting my time to think about how to advance high school education, but I am 
uh, really just uh, enthralled by this and the possibilities. It's the reason I've been working so hard and the reason we have such an extraordinary team at the Case Method Institute working so hard to engage and train teachers to bring these discussions to high schools and to public venues all across the country. Because I think it may represent at least one small step, small, but I think also an important step towards strengthening our culture of democracy. Now, normally I would end there, and I know uh, I, I, this got to me a little bit late and we're already over time, but because I'm at the American Philosophical Society, I, I, I just can't resist concluding with a word about Benjamin Franklin. So let me just take a, a, another minute. As you may know, and I wanna go back to obviously a very famous date, July 4th, 1776, shortly after the Continental Congress approved the Declaration of Independence on July 4th. The very next thing they did that day was to appoint a committee of three. This is a little known fact. A committee of three, a heavyweight committee, including John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin, to design a two-sided seal or emblem uh, for the new United States of America. So they, they just created this new nation literally that day, and they decided they needed some marketing material. So they get their best, guess pe best people on it. Ultimately, the design that Adams, Jefferson, and Franklin produced, it took them about six weeks, uh, it was rejected by Congress. So Congress goes out and finds a, a more appropriate designer. However, three Latin words that appeared on that original seal were retained. And those words were e pluribus unum, out of many, out of many one. Now, as you could probably guess, there's been some discussion over the years about where those words came from. Many have assumed, for example, that they came from a great Roman thinker, possibly Cicero or Horgel or Horace or Virgil. And, and I think I was taught in school that it was Cicero. Anyway, it turns out that's probably not true. Far more likely, it was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, it, it, it seems, plucked these words, e pluribus unum, from the cover of one of his favorite publications, and, and that was Gentleman's Magazine. Now, Gentleman's Magazine from the 18th century, despite its name, some people have some uh, thoughts of maybe it's another kind of magazine. It turns out it was a literary publication. And in fact, it was one of the first uh, literary publications to pull together pieces or fragments of many different essays, many different literary works in a single issue. Um, in fact, the, the word magazine literally, as you know, means repository or storehouse. And normally that word had always been used in a military context. Gentleman's Magazine, this was actually the first, you can look in the Oxford English Dictionary, th this is the first use of the word magazine in a publishing context, a repository or storehouse of literary works. In any case, on the cover of Gentleman's Magazine was a sketch of an outstretched hand holding a bouquet of flowers and the words, e pluribus unum. And the message was clear, out of many flowers, one bouquet, out of many literary works, one magazine. And for Franklin, it was just a short step to his preferred meaning, out of many states and peoples, one nation. Now, I suspect knowing Franklin or, you know, uh, the kind of, he had a mischievous sense of humor. He got a kick, I think, out of suggesting a national motto that came not from Cicero or Horace or Virgil, but from the 18th century equivalent of Reader's Digest, kind of lowbrow. In any case, it was quite a remarkable insight of his to see from the very beginning, from 1776, that the unique promise of, of America lay in harnessing difference and diversity toward a common purpose through self-governance. It's really a, a great, great aspiration, e, e pluribus unum. Now, then as now, I think it's natural to ask where unity is to come from in a country as diverse and divided, and, and divided as the United States. It's not gonna come from a common religion, not from a common national origin, not from a common perspective on the size or role of government. Rather, I think unity must come from a common faith in democracy itself, from our shared commitment to self-governance, from our culture of democracy. And I think this is broadly what Franklin had in mind when he suggested the words e pluribus unum in 1776. These, these three words have proved enormously powerful and I think they continue to define our most fundamental challenge as a nation today. So that's what, what I tried to address in this uh, somewhat varied talk. In any event, uh, given that we're at the APS, it, it seemed fitting to end uh, with, with Franklin. So um, I'll leave it there. I don't know if there are time, there's time for any questions, but it's been a pleasure and, uh, and thank you for having me today. 
I, I, I thank you. Thank you so much, David. This is a, a terrific project and a wonderful close to your talk. Um, I think uh, even though we're running a bit late, we'll take uh, just a, uh, a few uh, uh, questions. Uh, one is uh, sort of ver uh, very concrete. Uh, uh, Jerry Sabloff, uh, one of our APS colleagues asked, is there a website we can link to learn more about your project? Sure. Um, if, if you just go to, we're, we're just standing up this organization, but if you go, it's called the Case Method Institute. So if you go to cmi.org for Case Method Institute, cmi.org, uh, you will, you'll find it. Yep. That's that's excellent, and and here's one that that really from David Hollinger, which really uh, I think it's 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 sort of connected to what you what uh, some of the some of your closing words. He asks, to what extent does a commitment to a culture of democracy depend on demographic homogeneity? We all celebrate diversity, but the New Deal, the Fair Deal, and the Great Society all expanded democracy at a time where the time where there was almost no immigration. Wasn't the culture of democracy at its strongest between the mid thirties and the mid sixties? If that's right, what does it mean? I mean, and he says mid 1930s to mid 1960s. If that's right, what does it mean? So I, 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 I don't think that's right. And I, and I hope it's not. Um, and certainly there have been many moments when there has been a, a large inflow of immigrants um, and, uh, and, you've, and you've seen efforts. Again, the, the early democracy that I was talking about in the antebellum years is, a, is sort of a quasi or proto-democracy. Um, it's not a modern democracy in the sense of universal suffrage. But if you look, I, maybe here's just an interesting or maybe fact that I can drop in that will help answer this question. If you look in the early 19th century, um, when you saw the rise of the, the sort of the birth of public education, you know, one of the strongest arguments for why public education was needed was that you did have a large inflow of immigrants, some, many of whom didn't speak English, and and or, uh, or or more importantly, even if they did, some, many did, they didn't have the kind of values of of self governance in the United States. And so there was this idea. Now, some of this was very associated, unfortunately, with kind of anti-Catholic bigotry. So we have to be careful about it. But there was this idea that by moving forward with public education you could actually strengthen the culture of democracy. And, and so I think that in fact, uh, there are ways of dealing with diversity. And the question is not, does that diversity make it impossible to get along? That's a, something we have to worry about. It's not though that do we have different views? Different views is a strength, not a weakness. The question is, do we have anything in common? And so I would say we have to work very hard. The more heterogeneous we are, the more we need to make sure we have that culture of democracy in common. And that's that's what you saw uh, in many points throughout American history. I, I, I hope now we, we, we can uh, recognize the same thing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks to all of our presenters this afternoon. And uh, I think we have to wrap it up now, but I will remind you that uh, at seven o'clock this evening, we have a virtual concert from uh, the stage at uh, our celebrated uh, Franklin Hall. Uh, and uh, I invite you all to attend the, the uh, recital by the re renowned uh, pianist Jeremy Dink. Uh, I'm sorry to report that I give the one part of the introduction. You'll have to see me again. But uh, aside from that, it should be a wonderful event. So thank you again so much.